Hi, everyone. It's Grace Pedota from the CSC and welcoming you to our weekly Tech Tuesday virtual session. This week, we will be highlighting conversations around royalty financing for growth. Before I introduce our moderator today, I would like to take a moment to tell you more about the CSC TV on YouTube, the Canadian Securities Exchange Forum for conversations with business leaders and entrepreneurs. I've put a link or I will put a link to the CSC TV in the chat room, which you can find to the right of your screen. I'm also putting a link to another initiative called CSC Health Tech Thursdays that will focus on innovative technologies that are changing the health sector. This week's topic is wellness. I will post a link to that in the chat as well. And without further ado, Mark Francis. Thank you very much, Grace. And thank you for getting us launched back uh, in 2021. So welcome to the relaunch of Tech Tuesday 2021. In January, we will have special presentations laying important groundwork for later, returning to our three company Tech Tuesday format in February. Next week on the 19th, we will talk about financial instruments used by small private tech companies and the complexity which often has to be sorted out if they are to go public. And in fact, probably a complexity that doesn't help them when they're private. Unrecorded sweat equity, safe notes, unpriced convertible notes, multiple exit preferred shares, and so weiter the reasons why they were used and how they can be resolved by going public. Our guest panelists will be Mike Weiner, partner with Dorsey in Denver, and Terry Booth, partner with RSN Calgary. On the 26th, we will actually have three sessions on the matter of plant proteins. All times mountain, at noon, we will look at the overall trends in food and plant proteins. At 1 p.m., we'll discuss the science of plant proteins. And then at 2.15 p.m., we will dive into the food lab and why there are challenges to making cheesecake without dairy or what freezing non-meat products can do to texture and taste. Why are we doing that? So that we can all better understand the challenges companies face when we hear from a whole cascade of food companies on Thursdays in February, CSE's Plant Proteins, the New Age of Food, plus, of course, the regular Tech Tuesdays in February. So a veritable virtual pub crawl for an entrepreneurs and small cap investors throughout the whole month of February. And as Grace mentioned, in case you feel a need for a fix from some tech company presentations now, as in this month, check out the digital health tech companies as part of CSE's Health Tech Thursdays, which returns for January 14th, 21st and 28th. And uh, today we have two presenters, we have Michael Bosdet, PhD, a shred expert and an amateur magician. So I have been informed uh, by uh, a birdie uh, and an expert. On, he will speak on protecting SR&D credits, shred credits. And Kevin Learned, PhD, former entrepreneur, business school academic and leading US angel investor, leading us through the wherefore and the why of what the junior mining investor in me thinks of as revenue link capped royalty financing. And after each of them presents, you'll get me back for the Q&A. So let's start with Mike. After obtaining his PhD in chemistry, Michael joined TSGI Corporation, where he has worked his way up over the last 12 years and currently serves as president. TSGI is a leading shred company in Canada. He is a senator at the University of Calgary, a judge for the Global Energy Awards, a mentor for numerous startup and early stage technology awards and competitions, and a contributing author to energy industry and technology publications. Mike, it's all yours. All right, well, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, really appreciate the invite, though I have to admit, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about with anything having to do with magic, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, so yeah, I appreciate the invite. Um, I just want to touch on uh, an important topic for, for any entrepreneur. Um, and hopefully it's a topic that most people are familiar with, but I want to make sure and just go through uh, at a high level uh, what SHRED is. So first and foremost, hopefully everybody's aware SHRED stands for Scientific Research and Experimental, Experimental Development. Uh, this is a tax incentive program uh, in Canada for Canadian companies. And, you know, the, the important take home here is that it doesn't matter what area of science and technology you're operating in. 
uh, the government is giving out over $3 billion a year to help support the growth of these types of companies. So uh, if you didn't know about it, you should. And if you do know about it, that's great that we're off to a good start. So I guess what I really want to talk about is, is why you care about SHRED. Um, SHRED comes through the tax system. It's delivered as investment tax credits. And I don't need to go through all of the dollars here or all of the percentages here that are in this table, but what I want to do is tell a bit of a story and give the general sense here. So um, at the top line on this table, um, you know, I've got just a few representative provinces listed, but private companies uh, you'll see across the board are benefiting more significantly uh, for their shred than are the public corporations. And, and this is certainly one of the considerations for an early stage company. You're thinking about going public. What are the implications for shred? And it is significant because this can be a big, big part of the, the funding that you are receiving early on. So those private companies, you're talking 40 to even you know mid 50s in terms of a percentage that you're getting back. And the really key thing here for the private companies is that private companies are getting back a refundable tax credit. In other words, cash, even if they're not taxable, even if you're not profitable, you're still getting back a tax credit, a refundable cash tax credit, uh, even if you're not currently taxable. It's a huge, huge win. Now, when you make that step to going public, uh, things change in the shred world. Your percentages, for one, you can see they universally drop off. We're now talking sort of low 20s to low 30s. Um, but the most significant thing is probably the fact that now those investment tax credits become non-refundable. They're mostly going to be non-refundable across the board. And what does that mean? That means that you're not getting a cash return. You can still make claims even if you're not profitable, but you're no longer getting that cash injection. Now, it's not to say that these investment tax credits aren't worth pursuing, though, because they can actually be carried forward for up to 20 years. So as long as your company is going to be profitable sometime in the next 20 years, these still do have value. And I'll mention a couple of other reasons that they have value in a minute. Um, I don't want to go through all of the rules about what it is exactly that Shred supports and all the, the criteria that need to be met. But just in general, Shred is intended to support the search for new knowledge. Um, and that knowledge has to be a new science or a new technology and your understanding of the science and technology. It doesn't support the development of a new product, at least not that in and of itself. So when I get approached and say, hey, we've got this great new thing. I mean, that's really cool and I love to hear about it, but I need to know more of the detail about the scientific discovery, the technical discovery that's going on in order to qualify. Now, rather than going through all of the rules around what does and doesn't qualify, what are some of the clues that you might want to look at to know are you or aren't you doing shred? Um, you know, are you going after patents? Are you even just thinking about uh, looking into a patent? Are you publishing technical findings or are you relying on technical papers uh, to try to help inform the decisions that you are making? Uh, do you have PhDs and masters, high power technical teams? These are just some of the indications that say, you know, maybe the stuff that you're doing would qualify and you should be looking at this tax credit if you aren't already. Now, there's a bunch of other things that you want to consider with Shred. Um, it's actually, there's a ton of nuance and a ton of opportunity with it. So some of the things that particularly early stage companies want to be thinking about, uh, think about your corporate structure. Uh, association rules can really, really uh, uh, cut into the Shred returns that you're able to achieve. Uh, for example, you know, uh, working with a private equity firm, if you've got that kind of a backing, Sometimes I can just knock down the percentage that you're actually able to benefit from with the, the Shred program. So, you know, it's a good idea to just be aware of that and, and how some of those relationships might impact you. Um, merger and acquisition benefits are a big, big deal. You know, if, if there's a chance, if you're building a company and you're looking to be taken out, well, the ITCs that you're acquiring and amassing potentially uh, for doing the Shred work, those actually have value and can be transferred to the acquirer. Um, so they carry value. Uh, and another thing that you can be thinking about, I mean, a lot of a lot of early stage companies are in this position where, you know, maybe that, that founder is not paying himself a salary or herself a salary. Well, you can be thinking about, OK, well, you know, are there some strategies? Yeah, there are. You can actually make some claims based on wages payable and not yet paid. 
Um, there's a lot of you know fine details in how to do that, but it is possible. So it's something to be aware of. Um, now, obviously, this is not the focus of the current conversation. We're talking about royalty financing here today in just a minute, uh, which I'm excited to learn a lot more about. But I want to just sort of paint the picture that you know, whether it's royalty financing, grants, angel investment, paying customers, loans, all of these things need to be considered as you're building your company. And really, TRID is one piece of that puzzle. And it interacts with all of them to a different extent. Um, you know, I can touch on a little, a little bit more in a Q&A, but just for now, I want to give the picture that all of these other forms of financing do impact your TRID claim and you need to know how to work with them. So, you know, why do you care about shred? Well, obviously I've mentioned that it's pretty generous. I mean, realistically, you know, for, for a private company, you're looking at, what is it, two and five engineers that are, their, their salaries are being covered by shred, if nothing else. For a public company, it's, it's a quarter. It's still extremely significant. And that ability to carry forward any unused or non-refundable ITCs, it's huge. Um, it's, it's also really powerful for due diligence perspective. So whether you're private or public, um, your investors are going to want to know or your shareholders are going to want to know that you've done that due diligence and you've looked into Shred. This is a powerful program in Canada. This is the most significant source of funding for any kind of technology development. You should be looking at it. And the last one, I mean, this can create a competitive advantage. I mean, that's the whole spirit of this program. It was created to intend to incent companies to take that step to build a competitive advantage. So not only are you building it with your technology, but by helping to support and offset the cost of that development, you're also building a competitive advantage. Um, where do we fit in? I'm not gonna go through all of this, but just things that I will stress, you know, all of you are trying to build a company and you're trying to get it launched and off the ground. So you want to make sure that you've got some support in this area instead of becoming an expert in this area, I would suggest. Um, make sure that you're finding a company that's going to handle all the technical reports and all of the tax forms and do, uh, you know, the, the defense of your claim for CRA. Like, think about these things and, and try to offload some of that work is, is what I would stress whoever you're working with. And uh, I think I'm within my seven minutes, so I will perhaps wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, while we're on the subject, I'll, I'll just ask you one question, and that is, uh, a company goes public and it's, if it's not yet profitable, they don't just have a reduction in the rate. They actually could, until they become profitable, they're not going to be getting shred back. Is that correct? Well, they're not going to be actually getting a return, but they are getting the non-refundable portion. So yeah, you're right. They're not going to be seeing the cash return as yet. They'll be seeing that tax credit mounting up that they'll be able to use one day. But yeah. Absolutely, they're not going to see the cash. If they become public, they will be able to. I mean, if they become taxable, they'll be able to access it. But if they Correct. don't become taxable, it's essentially lost. So it does become a risk as to whether they will receive it. Is that right? I, no, that, that I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. It doesn't become a risk of whether they'll receive it unless they're not planning on being profitable or sorry taxable in the next twenty years, because you can carry those tax credits forward for twenty years. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Michael. And now we're going to have Kevin Learned. Uh, Kevin trained as a CPA and was the co-founder of Learned Mon, a Boise software company that supplied its software throughout the U.S. to the banking and hospital industries and was the first Idaho software company to, to scale nationally. Uh, he exited profitably in 94. Following the exit, earned a PhD in entrepreneurship and strategy and became professor of entrepreneurship and strategy at a, and associate dean of the College of Business and Economics at Boise State and president of the College of Idaho. Following retirement, he was the co-founder of Venture College at Boise State, a co-curricular program to help students launch businesses while pursuing their education. Today, he is director emeritus of Venture College he has been an active angel investor involved with funding more than 50 companies, is past president of the Boise Angel Alliance, and a member of the National Board of Directors of the Angel Capital Association, where he is chair of the Education and Smart Practices Committee. He is co-founder of Loon Creek Capital Group, which provides a syndicate management system to simplify the work involved in creating, funding, managing, and liquidating investment syndicates. I think that's back to his software expertise. 
And he is a partner in Sage Growth Capital, a micro VC which makes revenue-based investments. That brings us around to his presentation. And one last item, he's also very active as a volunteer in particular with Rotary at a very senior level. Kevin, glad to have you with us. Thanks, Mark. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, Grace, for your work. And Michael, that was fascinating. I, uh, you know, I bring obviously a U.S. perspective to things, but uh, you Canadians do a wonderful job with your credits and supporting business, and I have uh, some degree of envy. However, the topic today is revenue-based financing, or as you call it, as Mark called it, uh, capped royalty. Uh, but let's talk about what this is. And then this little VC that I started with, uh, with a couple of people a year and a half ago, uh, to explore this uh, in the United States and Canada. So the fund itself is its classic VC structure. We have a fund and we have a management company. And my two partners and I uh, own the management company. And we provide the services to the fund. And that fund makes royalty-based or, or revenue-based investments. And, uh, and, uh, and the target companies are companies that are seeking growth capital that's non-dilutive. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about that. I'll talk generally about what is revenue-based financing, how it works, and how does our little company uh, implement this specifically. So if you think about financing growth, uh, entrepreneurs traditionally sort of have three choices, right? They can bootstrap the company. In other words, make the cash flow themselves off of selling their product to grow the company. And I would say, having worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs over the years that if you can do that, that's a wonderful way to go, but it requires free cash flow. And typically uh, it is much slower than raising capital that you can put into your organization to accelerate it. You may be able to borrow the money from traditional sources, but typically that's going to require collateral. Often it will require personal guarantees and many, many early stage companies are simply not eligible for uh, for uh, borrowing money, at least from banking sources. The third source then is sell stock. Go out and find investors who will share the risk with you and they will take an equity ownership uh, position uh, in your company. So revenue-based finance, we think sort of sits between these two. It's, it, it is a type of loan, uh, but it functions very much like equity. So the capital is provided by the entrepreneur, by the uh, investors, in this case, our fund, uh, in exchange for a percentage of ongoing revenues. Those revenue, those, those payments continue until a capped amount is reached. And I'll give you an example here. We happen to use our investment interest instrument as a convertible note. There are other ways of doing this, but there's some technical reasons. Uh, under U.S. law for uh, using a convertible note. I hasten to say the note only converts as if at the end of the contract there is still money that is owed us, which we hope, of course, is not the case. So we make an investment, the principal. Let's say it's $100,000. You agree to pay us back a multiple of that principal. Perhaps it's two and a half times our investment, so you're going to pay us back a total of two hundred. dollars and $50,000. So one key word in understanding this financing is what is the multiple? Multiples vary by investors from one and a half to five or six times. The second concept is what we call the revenue rate. And that is what percentage of your revenue are you going to pay towards this note each month? If, for example, your cash receipts the first month are $20,000 and the revenue rate is 5%, then at the end of that month, you're going to pay $1,000 towards the total amount that you owe us. Now, here's some advantages to this. It's growth capital without dilution. I want to say right up front, this is not a replacement for bank financing. If a company can qualify for bank financing, that's what they ought to do. Rather, this is a replacement for equity capital. Our typical um, company that we invest in has raised equity capital and is planning on raising equity capital again, 
but this is a way to pump money into the business that is non-dilutive. And if it works properly, the company's sales will accelerate. And when they return to the equity markets, they will return at a much higher valuation than what they could uh, achieve today. We don't charge any guarantee. We don't ask for any guarantees. We don't take any collateral from the business. We are a debt. We sit on the balance sheet, but it's an unsecured loan. Most importantly, that flexibility that comes with payments that are based upon revenue. This works great for companies that have seasonality or for companies whose revenues are going up because when revenues are low, the payment is low. When revenues go up, the payment goes up, which makes some sense because presumably that's how the cash flow works in the business. One of our first investments was in an ice cream manufacturer. Well, they sell lots of ice cream in the summertime and not so much in the wintertime. So last summer, the payments were substantial. Right now, they're pretty small because they're in their, they're in their down season for their, uh, for their, for their company. Uh, the note can be paid off at any time. And uh, as I said, it's non-dilutive to the entrepreneurs and to the shareholders. Now, principally, we find our investments because angel investors refer companies to this. And usually what they're looking for is a bridge to the next equity round. You might use a traditional convertible note, but that convertible note, of course, is ultimately going to become equity and be dilutive on the capitalization table. Our convertible note, if it's paid off, is not dilutive uh, at all. Here's sort of the criteria for our company. Now, you have several publicly held companies, one in Montreal and, and one in Vancouver that do this, but they tend to do it in the millions of dollars. We're looking for much earlier stage companies. So we're looking for companies that have $300,000 or more uh, trailing 12 months recurring revenue. The companies need to have stable gross margins because we're going to take our payment off the top. So obviously, if they don't have a margin, they're not going to be able to pay to us. What we're looking for is companies that can put this capital to work to accelerate their growth. And if you think about it, since there is no fixed payment amount, we're at risk for how long it will take for this note to be paid off. If it all works great, the companies deploy our capital and they accelerate their growth. And if they grow faster, we get paid back earlier. But of course, the company's very happy because they're growing like gangbusters and they get us out of their hair sooner. We say here a manageable balance sheet. This type of capital will not work to go in and restructure a balance sheet that's upside down that has too much debt and is having trouble servicing it. That's just replacing one form of debt with another. Where this works is you've got a reasonably stable balance sheet. The company knows its business model and it knows if it puts money to the marketing pedal or to new product development or other revenue generating activities that can make the sales go up. And as I say, our ideal candidate is supported by angels or angel groups because what we found is companies that have never sold stock or don't have a sense of how dilution works have a little trouble wrapping their mind around why this is a good value proposition. Here's our average uh, deal terms. We invest between $100,000 and $400,000, so we're fairly early in the cap table. Uh, we're not set up to do multi-million dollar investments, so our typical companies are one to three years old. The return cap, in other words, the multiple that we ask for, ranges between two and three times the investment that we make. Once we make the investment, there's a three-month grace period for the company to deploy the capital, and then they begin to make payments to us. When we model this, we model this to expect a return in three to five years, something in that neighborhood. And the revenue rate, or the percentage that the company is going to pay us will vary between three and eight percent. Now, you can think of those levers of how much money is borrowed, how fast is the company going to grow, what's the multiple that the company is going to pay us back, and what's the rate at which they're going to pay us back. And those we work with the company to come up with something that is satisfactory to the company. And of course, satisfactory to us as a manager of a portfolio of these kinds of securities. If this makes uh, sense to you, uh, you can go to our website, sagegrowthcapital.com. We got all kinds of information on there. We have a very simple application on there for people to get started. What we say is to read our criteria 
And if it fits you and fits us, we're most interested uh, in talking to you, and we will invest any place in the United States and Canada. So, Mark, I think that finishes uh, what I had to say formally, and I'm delighted to take questions uh, when it's appropriate to do so. Great. Well, you're going to get a few from me first, and let's have uh, Michael come back and join us. And uh, so my for to start with, let's talk about this from the company perspective. Um, it, it's taking a part of their margin. So, uh, you know, one of the risks that a company can face is they're starting to make sales and they lose perspective a little bit on keeping the margin tight. This actually, in a way, gives them, it keeps a little bit of pressure on them to keep their margins tight and worry about what their profitability is, doesn't it? Well, of course it does. Now, from a due diligence standpoint, uh, we are going to go back into the last 18 months records, month by month by month. We want to know that that company, by the time they're ready to take down this form of capital, has a strong gross margin and a steady gross margin. It doesn't work if the gross margins are all over the map. So it works for SaaS companies. It works for consumer product companies in particular, if they've got a solid uh, margin. But you bet. We're taking that money right off the top. So they're they're not going to stay in business if they don't have sufficient margin to support that. We, of course, don't want to invest in a company that isn't going to stay in business. So we're very interested in that margin. Right. And another aspect of this is you've worked with a lot of companies on the growth side. Can One thing you didn't touch on is that you have some expertise and some links that you can also share with the companies. So getting an investment, it's not just getting the investment, getting Sage growth in the deal can uh, can also presumably help a little. Is that not the case? Sure. I mean, you know, while we operate in a venture capital model, the three of us come out of the angel investing world, have been very involved as an angel investor myself for more than 20 years. We're well connected throughout the United States and Canada. And of course, it's in our best interest if we can make a referral or introduce somebody to some to somebody in the network. Uh, we're certainly going to we're going to do that. There is a question in the chat room, which is, are the payments deductible for tax purposes? And I can't speak to that under Canadian law. Maybe you guys can help me. But here's the way we treat this in the United States: the first payments coming back are a return of principal. So if we loan you a hundred thousand dollars. We're going to treat the first hundred thousand dollars back to us as a return of principal, and of course, that is not deductible. Thereafter, the balance of that is interest expense to the company, interest income uh, to the investors. And under U.S. tax law, of course, interest expense is deductible. I presume it is under Canadian tax law as well, assuming that you've got some income that you could use that deduction for. That's good and delighted, of course, Ellie Aviv, uh, my friend Ellie, would come up with that question and be on that on the mark there. Uh, Michael, do you have anything to add on that? And we know you're not uh, corporate tax experts, you're shred experts, but do you have any perspective to add on that? Um, maybe just to, to well, I could put on my own flavor of that. I, I, I think that that is a correct assessment that those rules would apply and count as well. Uh, but I am not, as, as you say, a corporate tax expert. Um, but what I would say is it's, it's an interesting model because uh, to the extent that you are at first paying back that initial principal amount, um, you know, according to the shred rules, a company would, uh, that would actually be seen as, as a forgivable loan. It would reduce the shred, but as you pay back those amounts to the extent that you're paying back the principal amount, um, you can actually be then uh, getting your shred back on those repayments. So it's an interesting little synergy there. Yeah, so the shred would sort of subsidize the payments. If that you is correct, yeah. Yep, that's yeah. correct, yep. No wonder I'm so anxious to do a deal in Canada. <laughs> Well, I think you already have done one or two as well, haven't you? We have not. We have done due diligence. We've had some discussions. We've not actually uh, come to agreement with any of the companies, but we've been talking to some of the companies that have come through Tech Tuesdays, Mark, and, and uh, we continue to be interested in this. Well, I, and we'll talk about the investor perspective in a bit, but I, I think uh, I really wanted you on because this makes so much sense for companies. They don't realize... Uh, how dilutive equity can be. 
and uh, not burdening their balance sheet with a uh, with a secured debt is also a tremendous advantage. There's a Canadian, an Alberta-based company uh, that has done this for a while called AVAC, and Michael is familiar with them, and uh, they have done a number of these, but they um, they didn't have quite as precise rules. Since I'm sort of shifting to the investor perspective here. And so you require they already be in revenue and you, that you can already see some kind of a, uh, of a steady, stable margin. From an investor perspective, then, if someone is thinking, gee, should I call up uh, uh, that Kevin Learned guy and give him half a million dollars and participate in his fund, what kind of default rate do you have? And, and what is the experience in the U.S. with other funds that have, part have used this mechanism? So... The mechanism in terms of putting it into a venture capital format and making these kind of investments is relatively new. There may be now um, 40 or 50 small, most of them small companies like ours that are experimenting with this. Uh, you've got a couple in Canada. Uh, Tamiya in Vancouver is a publicly held company, but they're doing deals in north of $2 million. My partner, Molly Otter, was the chief investment officer for a, for a private equity firm in Seattle that pioneered this in the United States called Lighter Capital. And what she tells me is in the several hundred deals she did, she never once lost principal. Um, so, you know, you're, you, this is lending money to companies and you have to put on an underwriter's hat uh, as you make the investment. Now, because we're early stage, obviously we're taking a lot of a lot of early stage risk, not as much as if you'd finance a company this way that has no revenue, but certainly more than if they've got a solid balance sheet and, and, and good cash flow. Having said that, the returns that we're trying to create to our investors in our fund are an, an internal rate of return of someplace in the neighborhood of 25%. And we think that matches up very favorably to the IRR that a portfolio of angel securities might produce. But as you know, angel investing is a game of, uh, of home run hitting. It's not quite a hockey analogy to that, I guess. But, you know, if you go for home runs in the game of baseball, you will strike out a lot. Uh, so the game of angel investing is trying to hit home runs. And if you're really good at this, you'll only lose all your money half the time. So you're looking for that big, big exit. This is much different. I, I say we're out to hit singles, and if you hit singles and never strike out, then you can win the game as well. And so we're not going to make huge 10 and 20 times our money on any investment. We're going to make two, two and a half times our money on our investments. But over time, that will produce a nice return to the investors. But to the entrepreneurs, they need to think about this. If they sell stock, Convertible note that's going to convert to stock or, or, or a safe, or other instruments that are going to be dilutive. Those investors are going to hope that if the company's successful, they're going to make 10 or 20 or 30 times their money. Well, guess whose hide that comes out of? It's the entrepreneurs who have given that up. So our bargain is pay us two times, two and a half times the money, and we'll go away. Now, you have to make those payments on a regular basis off of your revenue. So we're not going to wait for 20 years. But it will be, for a successful company, it will make an enormous difference to the percentage of the company those entrepreneurs own at the end of the day when they go to sell that company. Well, and I think it's also, uh, from an investor standpoint, and by the way, 25% per annum would be, for an overall angel portfolio, I think would be pretty outstanding. Uh, you you take that over 10 years and that's a pretty incredible rate of return, but you can see why it works because you, the principle is almost certainly, uh, even in a bad scenario, the company's unlikely to go bankrupt in the first six months. So you're gonna get some payments back regardless. And as you pointed out earlier, the faster the company grows, uh, the faster you get repaid. So your rate of return annualized implicit is higher. But one of the things that really interests me is that at an early stage, um, there is often a uh, dissonance between what the entrepreneurs really believe, and they have to be op ferociously optimistic about their company, 
what they believe it's worth and what someone in our position sits back and says, well, but there's this and this and this and this risk. So in a way you cut through that problem. There's no longer a valuation argument, right? You know, having personally negotiated perhaps 50 term sheets and I teach a course for the Angel Capital Association on term sheets. I also teach one which I'm doing tomorrow if anybody's interested, uh, introduction to capitalization tables. So I've been living this for 20, 25 years. This new kind of investment, the most delightful thing is there, I don't care what your valuation is. It's not part of the negotiations. And I don't care what your exit strategy is. That doesn't make any difference to me either. I just care about what your revenue stream is, what your margin is, and what we think that revenue stream is going to go to. That leads to a much more aligned discussion, I think, with the entrepreneurs. We today close a $400,000 investment with what is basically a family business. And, 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 and no angel would ever invest in this business because there's like 10 family members working there. They're not building this business for that exit. They're building this business for the children and the grandchildren. Well, I don't care. If I can provide the capital to help them grow, they win. And, uh, and so does Sage and our investors. And if they've proven to be overly optimistic, um, you're still going to get paid maybe a few years later, a, a year or two later, but you'll still get paid. You know, that's, that is the, that, because there's no fixed payment amount, no fixed term, that's the risk that we're absorbing. And, uh, and you know, we've, we've spent lots of time talking about that and, and lots of time doing pro formas and, and, and modeling the companies. But it's not a surprise to the entrepreneur because we're going to start with the entrepreneur's models and, and build out from there. And at the end of the day, this investment has to work for the for the entrepreneur and his or her company and it has to work for us or you know if this is good for both sides then it will be a lousy investment for us and lousy source of capital for the entrepreneurs so i think i think we're very aligned and it takes that hammer of i'm going to try to pound on you to reduce your valuation as low as i possibly can and the entrepreneur is going to try to pound on me to get the valuation up as high as she possibly can it takes that off the table yeah Michael, I want to turn to you. Another aspect that strikes me about this type of financing is that, um, you know, as an investor, as an angel investor, I'm sure both of us have worried about uh, uh, management salaries, board direction, that kind of thing. And a new group of investors wants influence. But then you've got a problem when you need several rounds. And you, you, you know, you have a limited number of spaces to put for in investor influence. Talk to me about how you think your clients respond uh, when they don't actually have to make room for a board seat or advisory member. Um, do you see anything there? Oh, I, I think that, the, I mean, I, I, I'm just fascinated. I think this is just a fantastic model that I didn't know enough about before, clearly. And I just, yeah, I absolutely love the, I mean, just overall, the, the barriers to entry seem very, very low. There's not the confrontation, whether it's around valuation or around the board seats. Um, I mean, I, I guess I would I would pose the question just, you know, how much uh, when you're doing these investments, uh, Kim, like how much are you looking at that management team? How much does that then factor in? I mean, you, you said you don't, you know, it's not so much about um, some of the other traditional aspects that we'd fight about, but management still is a big, big deal, certainly in the angel community. Is that, does yeah. that come into play here for you? Of course, Michael. I mean, I... Yeah. We're going to start our assessment always with the management team, like any other investor. And even if you're a bank, right, they want to know who are the people and what's their credit history and all those kinds of things. And so we, of course, have to have faith in that management team. One of the reasons that we like investing in companies that angels have already invested in and are they're supporting is because, of course, they will provide some of that governance that traditionally angels ask for. We're not going to do that. We're not going to take seats on the board. We're not going to take advisory board seats. We're going to have more hands off. We're certainly interested in helping the company if we can and advising it, but but it's not like uh, like an angel or a traditional traditional VC out there. But that, 
you know, we're going to do background checks and credit checks on the entrepreneurs as part of our due diligence. We've got to know that the people that we're dealing with are honest, can manage their own personal affairs uh, before we're going to entrust them with our money to grow their business. But that, you know, for most of the people that come to us, that's fine. You know, I mean, we all have developed antenna that can, can that can uh, rule out people that don't seem forthright and honest and uh, uh, have a sense of how they're going to build a business fairly quickly and fairly easy, easily. Kevin, uh, when a company takes this financing, do do you have to do a fair bit of education of the uh, the corporate advisors, the the lawyer, uh, the auditor, um, and others, or or do you find that it's pretty simple and and company and the corporate advisors catch on quickly? Well, uh, you know, the answer to both questions is yes, <laughs> depending upon who the advisors are and how sophisticated they might be. So, the first deal we did. The entrepreneur used an attorney that couldn't wrap her mind around this, and she came back with with dozens of pages of red lines on our documents, and and it was like, hey, we, you don't understand what we're trying to do here. We've been at this now eighteen months, and even in that period of time, um, we're seeing more and more of this kind of investing, and and so the the sophisticated um, counselors that deal with early stage businesses can wrap their mind around this fairly quickly. It's a fairly simple transaction once you get through it. I'm going to loan you money. You're going to agree to pay me back a percentage of your revenue until I've got a capped amount. If at the end of the period of time, and I'll talk about that in a moment, you haven't paid me all back, I've got the right to convert what I've got left into stock. Obviously, I don't want to do that. The entrepreneur doesn't want me to do that. Uh, it's not going to be a surprise if the note is not performing as we expected. And we're going to have a discussion before we get there. Let me talk about due dates because there is a final due date on this. There's got to be some point when we say it's all wrapped up. So we sit down, work with the entrepreneur, work with the projections. We do a preliminary pricing for the entrepreneur and say, look, we will loan you $200,000. Uh, you're going to pay us back. 4% of revenue every month until you paid us back $500,000. We think that will take 48 months. Does that make sense to you? And sometimes the entrepreneur says, yeah, I like that. Other times they say, boy, I think it's going to take longer now. Okay, tell us how long you think it's going to take, and we're going to go back and forth. Or they're going to say, you know, I just can't stomach paying you $500,000 for a $200,000 loan. I say, okay, well, tell you what. We, how about we increase the revenue rate to 7% and you pay us until we receive $400,000. Right now, if you understand interest, you see it's exactly the same deal. Uh, it just changes the time frame. So we manipulate those to get something that's satisfactory to us and satisfactory to the entrepreneur. But at the end of the day, we say, okay, we've all agreed it's going to take 48 months to pay this off. We being Sage will add 12 months to that and say the final due date that it must all be cleaned up then is 60 months. And that's just our way of saying we all understand at some point you have to be out of this deal. Well, if we're into it 48 months and there's still money owed, you know, we know at what rate it's being paid off now. We're going to sit down to the entrepreneur and say, what are we going to do to get this thing cleaned up in the 60 months that we have out there? Um, but at the end of the day, if there's, if there's anything left, it's going to be pretty tiny or things have really gone to hell in a handbasket. And we do have the right to say, well, we need to clean this up and we need to exchange that for the stock in your company and move on. But I hope never to do that. Can I jump in with a question? Yes, Mark? please, Michael. Also, please. Um, I think in your presentation, you mentioned sort of the average. It sounds like the two and a half multiple is kind of the average, but I think you said somewhere from one and a half to six uh, was was maybe on the table. And I was just curious, like, what, what gives a six uh, X? Uh, where, okay. where, where, where do you factor that in? So our rules in SAGE 
are the multiple will be two to three. I, we're not, you know, I, well, I shouldn't say we wouldn't go lower than it. There's, we've done some at one and a half that look like they're going to pay off very quickly. And we've done some deals. Let's say that the multiple is two and we expect this is going to be paid off in four years. Well, we all know what the entrepreneur is going to say. I'm going to grow much faster than you think I'm going to grow learned. And what if I pay you off in 24 months? And so sometimes we've made this deal. Tell you what, you pay me off in less than 36 months, you owe me 1.5 times my investment. If you pay me off in 36 to 48 months, you owe me two times my investment. But if it takes longer than 48 months, then you have to pay me two and a half times my investment. I, you know, those are all examples. But from our standpoint, the multiple, we're not, if the deal requires a multiple greater than three, then there it's too risky a deal for us, or it's going to take too long or something like that. But there are companies out there in this universe of people who do this kind of investing that perhaps will loan you money and say, you don't owe me anything for two years. But then what I want is four times my money over 10 years. So you can manipulate those variables uh, in order to come up with something that works for the company and something that works for the investors. So in our case, the multiple will be between two and three times. The revenue rate, the share of your revenue that you pay us will be between three and eight percent. And within those, we can manipulate those two numbers to do something that'll work for the company and that will work for us. The reason we cap this at eight percent is you don't want a revenue rate that's so high that you cause people to cheat on you. Right? If you got to give me 20% of your revenue, the temptation to do some things under the table to not call some things revenue in order not to have to pay me that gets out there. And, you know, we all assume we're dealing with honest people, but we don't want to put that kind of pressure. So we think more than 8% of revenue coming to this kind of deal, if it takes more than that, then it's not appropriate. This, this kind of investment's not appropriate. They need to get their revenue up or they need to be growing faster to do that, Michael. Very good. Do either of you, we're uh, now at the uh, at, at three o'clock mountain. Do either of you have a final comment you'd like to make here? Michael? Uh, I didn't have anything planned at all. Oh, you uh, could like try to... a magic trick, even though you're not a magician. I, I'd I, love to see I, it. I actually, I actually was going to comment on exactly that. I was going to <laughs> call Mark on that because I have no idea what Where you're talking about. Somebody <laughs> claims to know you, Michael. <laughs> you said really? you were very smart, met you in university, and you were a magician. That's what he, an amateur magician. That's what he claimed. Anyway. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So there's going to be a follow on conversation here because that's very confusing. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think beyond... your companies would be interested in this. Yeah. What? A, what? A, when you were in college, you could make beer disappear quickly or something like that. Yeah. yeah that, that, that is a skill set that, that I've retained for sure. <laughs> But uh, anyway, no, I, I, I guess my, my takeaway is, uh, you know, it's, it's very much what I was saying before. If I were to, to speak to the entrepreneurs out there, um, bottom line is if you, if you don't have a shred solution in place, um, you should be asking about it at, at, at the very least for your own peace of mind. Um, you know, it's, it's something that's out there, it's available because, and I would say that, you know, if, if you're thinking, well, geez, you know, I don't know if I want to take the time for this. Let, let me tell you that your competitors are taking the time for this. And it's pretty hard to be 40% smarter than the rest of the competition out there. Well, and I would say as a longtime angel investor, and now even as a revenue-based investor, that it just makes great common sense that if we can get somebody else to provide capital to us, we should take advantage of that, especially tax refundable tax credits, which are really, really super. I think my final comment, Mark, uh, I, I've tried to make this simple. It it can get a little more complicated than this. I hold regular office hours on Thursdays. Uh, people can email me and they can sign up if they want to talk to me. Uh, our website, uh, sagegrowthcapital.com, has got a world of information on it. If somebody thinks they qualify for this, there's a very simple little application to fill out. 
online that gets this started. And, uh, you know, like all investors, we're looking, we're looking for deals. So would be delighted to, uh, to hear from any of the people in the audience. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to explain the capital to your audience. Well, that's great, Kevin. And uh, you're presenting tomorrow uh, at the Angel Capital Association. Could you give I'm, people a quick link sure. to that? angelcapitalassociation.org and click on education and there's a bunch of stuff. I'm chair of the education committee. So my job there is to provide education to angels to try to teach them best practices in angel investing. But of course, we're thrilled to have entrepreneurs participate in these classes because the more entrepreneurs know about angel capital, the better it goes for everyone. So tomorrow I'm doing what we call an introduction to capitalization tables, which is how does a capitalization table work? It's a 55 minute webinar. And at the end of it, I provide everybody with an Excel worksheet that they can use to create their own cap tables. So if that's of interest, go to the angelcapitalassociation.org website and you'll find it there. And it's at 10 o'clock, 10 to 11 mountain time tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, and Mark. It's great to see you again, and I treasure our cross-border relationship. As you know, I have an aunt in Calgary, and someday you finicky Canadians will let us Americans back across the border so that I can come to Calgary and see my cousins and my aunt and and, and go skiing up in, the, uh, in Banff. Right. Uh, well, indeed, we sure want you to come back, too. I and am anxious to get there. Thank you. Um, yeah. Andy asked what happens if we're not members. I think they're saying if they're not members of the Angel Capital Association, there's a small, if you're members, the webinar is free. There's a small fee if you're not a member. And I think it's a hundred dollars. Okay. I'm not, I'm not sure, but you could you could get that off the website. Very good. Well, thank you both very much for your time today. Michael Bosdet, president of TSGI and Kevin Learned, partner of Sage Growth Capital visit their websites and come back next week for discussion of the different financing tools used by early stage tech companies and how going public can help resolve those complexities that occur as a result. And of course, tune into CSE Healthcare Talks for the next three Thursdays and then Plant Protein for the first three Thursdays of February. And of course, the replay always available on CSE TV within a couple of days. So this is Mark and Grace from CSE Tech Tuesdays, signing out. Thank you very much.